know that the golden poison dart frog, Phyllobates terribilis, is uh, one of the most toxic animals on the planet? Uh, according to National Geographic and the Rainforest Alliance, uh, who you've probably seen uh, sustainability stickers on like your coffee or fruit, um, these dart frogs have enough poison to kill about 10 full-grown adults. Um, so today, um, we're gonna go over the physical and various features of dart frogs, um, behaviors unique among them, like reproduction and uh, courtship. And uh, humans have uh, actually known them for quite some time, so we're gonna go over their significance to us and their uh, properties. Um, I actually keep and breed poison dart frogs. These are actually my actual frogs, the male and female right there. Um, I've been breeding them for about two years and they've had like 31 babies so far. This is an egg forming, this is one of their tadpoles, and that's a different frog in the bottom left, but that's one of the adults from about a year ago. Um, I've also been in touch with a lot of professionals in the hobby from uh, small local hobbyists to a lot of you know large names like Josh's Frog, which is like the largest online reptile store, New England Herpiculture, which is big in the East Coast. And they do a lot of conservation work with uh, a lot of habitat restoration in Madagascar, Ecuador, Colombia, uh, in the face of a lot of deforestation you are probably familiar with today. Um, so today I'll be going over dart frog facts of their unique defense mechanisms, um, their reproductive and parental behavior, which is unique among amphibians, and you probably don't think about you know, parental care when you think of frogs, as well as uh, their significance to both like ancient and modern humans. So I'll begin with their most famous attribute, the uh, toxicity. So um, they have what's called eposematic coloration. This means that compared to, or as opposed to other animals that would blend in to hide from predators and avoid being eaten, these guys actually are very brightly colored. And this actually serves as like a red flag or a warning to potential predators, you know, screaming, hey, don't eat me, you know, I'm poisonous. Um, and a lot of species actually are called imitator dart frogs, like this one over here is uh, random in my imitator very endless. It actually looks really similar to an actually poisonous species of frog, and they've taken advantage of this for the same reasons of avoiding predation. Um, and it's thought that um, in the wild, they get their toxic, uh, their alkal alkaloid toxins from uh, insects, mites, arthropods, and vertebrates that they eat, that eat uh, toxic plants, which build up and uh, move on to the frog. And so for such small and dangerous frogs, and again, you know, being frogs, you wouldn't think about complex behaviors or you know, even parental care, but they're actually quite famous for that, and they have a lot of their elaborate rituals, behaviors, and are very vigilant about that. So on the left is an Ufaga familial blue jeans dart frog, commonly known as a strawberry dart frog. Um, a lot of frogs, like this one in the picture, for example, will find a lot of roosting places, like they'll compete for like the highest spot to call a mate from. And they often sound like birds, like you wouldn't think it's a frog if you were out in the rainforest and heard these. Um, so after a lot of competition actually between the females who compete for the males, as opposed to a lot of other animals, uh, they'll select an egg laying spot usually around uh, you know, rocks, debris, logs, and leaf litter. And then once the tackles hatch after vigorous guarding by the adults, uh, like you see over here, they'll carry their tackles, you know, piggyback to a water source like these bromeliads here. This is actually the center or what the center of a bromeliad looks like, it actually cups some water. So they'll carry them around two to sometimes like a dozen tadpoles at a time. So um, another unique aspect of the parental care is again with the bromeliads. Sometimes they'll go over 100 feet into the canopy just to deliver the tadpoles, and they have more than one, so it's like on average, according to uh, uh, New England herpetoculture, half a mile a day for such a tiny frog. And they'll go back and forth in the day to check on these tadpoles and lay infertile eggs, as with what are called obligate egg feeders, which the frog on the left is a member of, uh, with a specific nutrition ratio that the tadpoles must have, meaning you know you can't isolate them from that diet, otherwise they die. Um, so, 
they haven't gone unnoticed by humans. We've known them for millennia. Um, probably by the bright coloration firsthand. Um, how they picked up on the toxicity, no one really knows how they first came across that concept. But on the far left, you can see a member of the Choco tribe in Colombia. Um, he's actually holding a basket of two or three golden dart rods. Um, he's about to prepare them for uh, tipping his arrow for hunting. So what they do is they'll agitate the frog a bit because normally when they're about to get eaten or something, they'll secrete the toxin. So that way it can release the toxins and then over there you can see him holding it down to kind of coat the tip. And that tip can actually stay toxic for a couple of months um, from initial uh, dosage. Um, up to today, they've found uh, certain properties in some dark frog toxins. So this species here is called Epipetobates tricolor, or the, the tricolor poison dark frog. And they uh, discovered a, comp a compound called Epipetidine. Um, they've looked into uh, properties for pertaining to painkillers, and uh, it's actually according to the according to the uh, American Chemistry Foundation under epibatidine, natural frog poison with a surprising benefit to humans, to be uh, about 200 times more potent than morphine in uh, painkiller properties. So even though the research the research is still in its infancy, uh, there's a large potential for uh, synthetic versions of this. Uh, chemical compound and hopefully to uh, improve the quality of life for many people with chronic conditions. So uh, dark frogs are mostly found from uh, northern Central America towards N uh, Nicaragua, Ecuador, Panama, all the way down to the Atlantic coast, uh, down into the Amazon basin. And um, while many people don't, you know, come up with the think of the frogs through their mind, you know, in their daily lives, it's important that we do uh, you know, do our best to protect their habitats because, as with the previous example, you know, they didn't know about the epibatidine uh, chemical compound, and that's super important to you know human medicine. Um, if we do lose these uh, habitats, obviously the frogs can't survive, and we could lose valuable uh, resources. And they're just so colorful, you know, we'd be ashamed to lose them. Um, And so uh, to conclude, uh, these dart frogs are very famous for their toxicity as well as their parental behavior, which is unique among amphibians, frogs in particular. Um, so their unique defense mechanisms, we went over aposematic coloration, which is uh, mainly their, uh, color, their bright coloration to ward off predators. And um, their uh, parental behavior, which they put a lot of effort and time into in order to uh, procure as many offspring as possible in a competitive environment. And uh, naturally, with their bright coloration, humans, they haven't gone unnoticed by humans who've uh, known about them and used their toxins for millennia up to now, where we're discovering uh, a lot of new properties. Um, So hopefully uh, we can continue to work on conserving their habitat so that both us <coughs> and the frogs